Olix Network 18, Mission Potion, Bhavishya Roshan. Welcome back. Well, uh, that is Biocon on your screen. It is off the day's low. There's an important uh, piece of information which is going to be coming up. That is basically the US FDA is going to decide on its biosimilar application for Pegfil Grastim. So the target action date is today and we're probably going to get to know about it this evening to tomorrow morning. So maybe there is some amount of optimism ahead of that. Do watch out for that one. But uh, Manisha now joins in to tell us what she's strategizing in the, or looking at in the commodity and currency space, Manisha. Thank you so much for that, Ekta. Well, it is about the crude oil prices where we have seen 8% of decline in the last two weeks. And this is a third straight day that we have seen prices continue to fall. So below 66 for the U.S. crude oil prices. And this is after the U.S. rig count continues to increase. The U.S. production is at record highs and the U.S. exports also are hitting record highs. And the markets also are getting concerned about the supplies because OPEC and the allies have been talking about increasing supplies to fill the gaps that are being created by the other countries. But then there is that discord coming in in the OPEC uh, it's itself, as you have seen, the Iran and Kuwait come out and say, or, or rather accuse Saudi Arabia of talking crude oil prices down. So it's going to be very, very interesting on how the 22nd June OPEC meeting really uh, takes place there. But joining us right now is Teague Nansekar to talk more about that. Nansekar, hi. What is your sense on the crude oil prices? What are you watching? How do you begin this week now for this space? I think uh, structurally, you know, we are uh, looking at uh, weaker sort of prices immediately because, uh, you know, of the overall fundamental uh, situation prevailing and with the increase in, uh, uh, you know, crude oil uh, exports and production in the U.S. adding to the negative sentiment. Uh, you know, but, but there are some critical supports. I think uh, one needs to watch out those levels very closely. Uh, somewhere dollar sixty-four or somewhere close to that happens to be some near-term supports. And I think if, if it does hold and then post the 22nd meeting, if there is any, you know, market perceived negative statements, then I, I guess prices could again rise uh, higher. But as of now, there, there's a lot of weakness and uh, many longs are being cut and, uh, and things like that. So it, it's a sell on any optics from here till still close to $64. Hmm. In the metal space as well, while of course it is a volatile sector as we see, but nickel surprisingly has been holding it for itself. So the shortage in supplies, the strong steel demand, all of that seems to be working in for that one. Is it a buy even at these current levels? Absolutely. I think, you know, we're looking at something like uh, $17,000 uh, at least. So, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, 1,150 or so in the domestic markets. That's the minimum. And, you know, it could even stretch uh, beyond that. Uh, let's also not forget the underlying strength it gets from the EV demand. So that that is also, you know, keeping the metal going very strong. And right, like you rightly said, I think the steel sector is also... Uh, helping and uh, the PMI numbers have come more or less neutral to positive. So all of that, you know, helping nickel quite positively. In overall base metal sector, I think nickel is well positioned to keep rising higher. Mm. Uh, before we let you go, what is also your sense on the precious metal space? Because we've seen very strong U.S. jobs data this week. The whole attention clearly will be at the G7 summit in Canada. That is where the headlines perhaps would be made. But ahead of that, uh, looking at the global queues, how would you want to treat the sector? Well, as of now, uh, you know, it has broken some key supports post the uh, NFP data and uh, with the FOMC also uh, coming up in a couple of weeks. I think the overall weak sentiment is going to continue now. Uh, you know, it was holding well above 1300, but I'm not very sure now. The technical picture has changed. I think it's heading towards $1,265. Okay. So it's a sell in any upticks from here. Okay, all right, Manisha and Ganeshikar, thanks very much for joining in and taking us through all of those strategies. We have Ashwini Gujal with us to talk about the technicals of the market now. Ashwini, hi, over to you then for the Nifty. Uh, it's recovered from that low that we hit and now it's been flat for most of uh, you know the trading session. But the bank Nifty is underperforming. You know, all this uh, opening and closing of windows is creating quite a bit of unnecessary volatility and is probably hiding more than it's revealing. Okay, Bank Nifty is down because of HDFC Bank, but why are 1,200 other stocks down? So it's clear that, you know, these sort of highs are unstable highs where nobody wants to buy into the broader market and you hold up five stocks every day and, you know, that way 
the market, the large cap indices keep uh, stable. So given the global queues, given our response, I think we are clearly underperforming as a whole market. And uh, I think all rallies from here, today's high kind of being the stop can be sold into even on the large cap indices because there's only so much 5, 10, 15 stocks can do. So for the moment, a good time to get short on Nifty, Bank Nifty. I think whatever the global market does, we should be lower uh, by the end of the day and mid cap sell off will resume once again. Having said that, uh, Jubilant Food after many days of uh, uh, you know testing 2500 is now moving up. So that's a buy with a stop of 2500 target target of 2650 uh, ncc is a sell with a stop of 122 target of 114 and orient bank is a sell with a stop of 80 target of 74 uh, ashwini i think on friday uh, late you would uh, recommended selling bml it's down uh, when you'd square square that up now or let it let it go see the problem with mid caps is that there is no buyer at all so uh, once something starts sliding, it you know just going downhill like a you know train which has been left from the top of a hill. So just remain short on all of these mid caps. The stories are gone now. Uh, you know the cost of capital has risen dramatically. So I think these are the only secular trades you have that wherever you know once a decline starts, it has tendency to continue. Okay, we've got some questions for you, Ashwini, from viewers. Uh, Sham is writing in, he's got shares of future retail. He wants to know whether, uh, I mean, he should switch to TVS Motors at current price levels. See, I think future retail is a better stock than TVS Motors, A. But if your question is uh, which stock will move up, then it's clear it's the consumption stories, you know, Nestle, Jubilant Food, you know, all these guys, Avenue, Supermart, etc. Those are the twin, etc. Those are the 25, 30 stocks which are going to go up or at least protect your capital. I don't think getting into a TVS motor uh, adds a whole lot of value. All right, uh, Ashwini, thanks very much. Uh, we will speak again in about an hour's time. Appreciate you taking us through those trades, advice uh, on the market. Uh, we will take a very quick break here. Uh, we get you more uh, opinion. Uh, we have a fundamental uh, opinion with uh, Nishchal Maheshwari, uh, who is head of institutional equities with Edelweiss Securities, uh, joining in. And uh, we'll come back, come to him in just a bit. Take that break, be right back. There is news at the bottom of the screen. This is uh, Supreme Court, which has directed the Committee of Creditors to not finalize decision on the bids for resolution of the Binaf, uh, Binani cement asset. Uh, and uh, Supreme Court has barred lenders from taking final decision, which is the same thing, a final decision on the, on the resolution process. So this is now up to, uh, I guess, uh, the legal authorities rather than the lenders themselves uh, in, ter in terms of who they want to go with. So the Committee of Creditors, which decides on uh, things mm -hmm. like which should be the which is the highest bidder and who they want to go with, which bid they should accept, is now uh, barred from taking that decision. Uh, Ashmit is joining us from the courts, uh, who is tracking this one. Ashmit, thanks very much. Good morning. I mean, what would this mean? Effectively, the decision is out of the COC, out of uh, the banker's hands. Well, what this does is that the apex court, uh, court has tried to balance the concerns of both sides. Dalmi, of course, was concerned that no decision should be finalised. Uh, as, in their words, the egg would then become unscrambable. The other side, of course, is of uh, Ultratech, who did know, who were clearly arguing before the uh, the Apex Court that their bid is higher by as much as a thousand crores. So, to balance both the sides, what the Apex Court has done is that, as far as Dalmi is concerned, it has said that no decision can be finalised. Uh, the concern, however, that was expressed uh, by uh, Ultratech essentially was that this order is likely to be misused. And on the back of that, what uh, the Apex Court has also added as a part of the order is that while no decision can be finalized, there is no bar on the COC from proceeding with the resolution proceedings. They can continue with weighing in on the bids offered by the various parties. They can continue with that process. But the only aspect is that no decision can be finalized. And all these proceedings, essentially, what the Apex Court has done is that it has put an umbrella, it has cast an umbrella over them by saying that all these proceedings and any decisions will be subject to further court orders. So towards that end, uh, the Apex Court has come out with what appears to be a nuanced order. Of course, we'll await more clarity from uh, the Apex Court. The Supreme Court is scheduled to hear this case now on July 2nd. For now, uh, the broad takeaway being that no decision can be finalized, but at the same time proceeding. Supreme Court allowing for the proceedings to continue uh, before the lenders.
Okay, all right, Ashmit. We leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and uh, giving us that update. We now have Nishchal Maheshwari of Edelweiss joining in to discuss the fundamentals of the market. Nishchal, hi. Thanks very much for joining in. Well, it's been a couple of volatile days for our markets, especially for the mid-cap index. I'm sure you're getting a lot of questions uh, with regards to what people should do with their portfolios and the kind of uh, rundown that they've seen in the mid-caps. Uh, what's your sense? So I think uh, 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 there has been uh, general volatility in the market and uh, in these kind of uncertain times, uh, you always see that uh, the mid caps are the hit the most. And uh, that's why we've seen uh, quite a bit of decimation as far as mid caps are concerned. Uh, some of these mid caps have uh, hit a good level basically uh, where one can start accumulating them. But I think a lot of mid caps still have some way to go. And uh, in between, there has been this scare of some of the uh, auditors resigning in a few companies. And uh, that has uh, set the cat among the pigeons. Uh, and that's why you see a lot of uh, stocks, uh, just because of a rumor or something else, uh, getting uh, hit uh, 8 or 10% down. Uh, but I think uh, one has to be selective. I think consumption is a space, basically, where one can look at it if there has been uh, stocks which have been hit very badly, basically one can go out and look at it because overall fundamentally uh, last quarter results also, otherwise also consumption as a space still looks interesting. Okay. Uh, Nishchal, you know, are you re-looking at your portfolio more closely and scanning through possibilities of say corporate governance issues coming up simply because of the auditor issue that you mentioned and you know, we've had a couple of instances of a board issue as well. So uh, we have been very careful, basically, uh, uh, when we actually bring any stock under coverage. And uh, that has been one of our uh, very big uh, goalposts, basically, to ensure that uh, the quality of auditors, uh, uh, the kind of corporate governance issues, and we go back into history of stocks. So I think uh, that's been our hallmark, basically, and uh, yes, uh, uh, do I once again go go back and uh, do a scrub of my portfolio? Definitely yes, uh, but uh, uh, touch wood, we have not had any issues as far as uh, uh, the current uh, rundown is concerned. Mitchell, hi, morning, Prashant here. I mean, you know, we were looking at a couple of uh, sell side brokers and what they've done with, through their earnings expectations for F519 uh, after the last quarter earnings. And we've seen uh, people bringing down at least three. We counted it. They've brought down their earnings expectations for 19. Uh, I mean, what is the nuanced way to look at these, uh, this earnings season? Because uh, there have been lots of companies where uh, earnings have been super. I mean, especially consumer companies, etc. We've seen big margin expansion coming through, maybe because of GST or whatever. But what's, what's, your, what's the way to look at these num uh, numbers, the earnings season gone by? Prashant, I was just looking at the numbers uh, in the morning, and uh, very interestingly, if I... Uh, look at it, uh, Nifty, as if I look at Nifty, basically, on a consolidated basis, Nifty is again grown at a, at a zero. So that's the earnings growth, basically, which you've had for Nifty this year. But if I do a bit of, uh, yeah, so if I do a bit of slice and dicing, basically, if I say um, X uh, corporate banks, it has grown at around 8%. Uh, if I do uh, X corporate banks and telecom, it's again somewhere around 8 9% kind of a growth. So that's a kind of growth, basically, uh, uh, which we are looking at it. So I think uh, one can, one should definitely look at uh, ex-corporate banks, given that the corporate banks have been one of uh, provisions which they had to make, uh, which they had to make this year, uh, this quarter. But going ahead, my worry still continues to remain, basically, that most of the market is still uh, 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 projecting a 25% kind of uh, earnings growth for FI19. And uh, when I go back and look at it, I think a lot of uh, uh, froth seems to be there. There has been a good amount of earnings growth which has been projected for PSU banks, corporate banks for the next year. So I think uh, uh, given what we've seen in the current year, I see uh, some amount of earnings cut definitely going to be there in FY19 estimates. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Nishal, what is your sense in terms of uh, what's happening with a couple of these pharmaceutical stocks? Dr. Reddy's is up 4% today. Do you think that uh, maybe they've probably bottomed out, they're reaching, reaching the bottom when it at least comes to the fundamentals? 
So I think uh, uh, as far as valuations are concerned, there seem to be uh, 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 a positive view on them. Uh, but uh, the uncertainty about the regulatory front still continues to remain. And that's the biggest uh, uncertainty which I see, basically, because uh, as far as the U.S. Uh, market is concerned, I think uh, there uh, it seems to be a bottomed out, basically. If you see the numbers coming from uh, uh, Taro for uh, Sun, I think it was a surprise for the market. It uh, grew better than the market estimates. Uh, but uh, then the regulatory uh, uh, outlook still continues to remain very, very muddled. Um, after three and a half years, a Sun is yet to get its uh, plant uh, sorted out. Same case for Dr. Reddy's. So most of the large companies basically are still struggling to get this uh, 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 thing sorted out. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, some amount of bottom fishing uh, can be uh, done, but... Uh, uh, still, I think uh, the regulatory framework still needs to uh, get sorted out before one can take the big leap into it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, Nichil, uh, as you and I have discussed many times, looking for uh, st stocks which are doing, which continue to do very well and buying more of those is, is the thing to do, but it is boring. I guess that's why people look for all, uh, try to do all kinds of other things, which is look for stocks which are down 40, 50 percent, which have not performed. I mean, I guess that is more exciting. So let's, uh, let me ask you uh, to identify, I mean, if you have uh, a couple of names from the latter category, uh, where, you, where, you, where, you serious, where you think there is serious value because of underperformance or whatever other reasons. So one of the sector, uh, Prashant, I've uh, watched, uh, I think it is corrected quite a bit, is the building products uh, industry. Mm. So, obviously, there has been uh, uh, challenges for the whole industry given DMA, uh, DMON happened and thereafter GST happened. I think the whole industry has got uh, pushed on the brink basically out there and uh, most of them have not been able to pu uh, get through uh, volume increases. Uh, most of the stocks have corrected 30 to 40 percent from the top and uh, seems to be in a, a good place to be. So, like the ceramic industry, Kajaria, uh, so it's gone down from 750 to 500 rupees. I think similarly the uh, plywood industry, Century, Green Ply. So look at this. Uh, this is a good good industry to be in. I continue to believe for the next five to ten years this industry will continue to grow 10 to 12 percent kind of a number. And uh, the big thing which is going to happen, given that the post uh, first of April, the uh, eBay bill is now underway, and uh, I think things are going to get sorted out for them. So the final, the finally, the movement uh, from unorganized to organized is going to start happening. So I see this industry particularly where uh, one can uh, do some more work and uh, look out for stocks. Mm. Okay. All right, Ms. Chil, we're going to wrap it up on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and speaking with us on the fundamentals of the market. Well, definitely a recovery, which has come in tad bit for the Bank Nifty. But uh, for the mid-cap index, it's now down around 0.4%, low point. Well, nothing much to incrementally talk about when it comes to uh, what's happening with regards to the market. So the Nifty is just about down by around 0.13%. But a lot of stocks from the mid-caps are now facing a little bit of pressure again. So PC Jewelers down 70% year to Day, down 13% today and something like quality is under pressure at this point in time as well. Pranjan Pandari, Chief India Economist, HSBC, joins in to discuss her expectations from Wednesday when the RBI will decide its uh, decision on what to do with the policy rates. Pranjal, hi, thank you very much for joining in. So what is uh, your call with regards to what the RBI might do in terms of rates as well as in terms of tone and guidance? Right. Well, uh, you know, we've been expecting uh, 50 basis points in rate hikes this year, 225 basis uh, points uh, hikes, uh, and the chance of a June hike has increased uh, at this point. So a big chance of a rate hike in June uh, in the upcoming policy meeting. In terms of the tone, well, you know, it's actually possible for the RBI to uh, keep the neutral tone and hike uh, while keeping a neutral tone in the same way last year. Uh, while keeping the neutral tone, it had actually cut. So they don't necessarily have to change the tone, but at this point, there's a strong chance they will because it signals uh, that they're on a sort of like a watchful mode at this point. So there is, uh, you know, a high chance that they will also make a, a 
call for a tighter stance in, the, in their tone. Uh, in terms of forward guidance, I think that's going to be the most important thing that the market will be looking out for because, you know, the market wants to know how many rate hikes in this cycle. Uh, at this point, you know, about two to three rate hikes are already priced in. And if the RBI gets assurance that the RBI is going to re uh, keep it at two to three rate hikes, then, you know, there might be some sort of comfort in the markets. Uh, but if the RBI signals that this is a start of a big, deep rate hiking cycle, then the markets can get a bit nervous. Our own thoughts here are that at this point, the RBI is going to keep it to about, you know, one to two rate hikes. You know, we have two in our forecasts because we don't see any reason for it to become a deep cycle at this point. You know, RBI always works with what inflation forecast over the next year will be. Uh, if you come down to December this year and you look ahead, actually a lot of the uncertainties that we're seeing, like MSP prices, oil and so on, would have been behind us and things would look much better. So we're actually just calling for two rate hikes now and then a prolonged pause. Okay. Um, Pranjum, what is your sense in terms of what might happen with bond yields if in case there is a hike that comes through, as well as in terms of, uh, say, the tone of the policy? Well, uh, you know, uh, you know the bond the bond deals are very sold off at this point, uh, but a lot of rate hikes are also factored in. So, if the RBI clearly gives a signal that uh, you know this is going to be one or two rate hikes and nothing more than that, then actually the bond deals might take it well and and they could relax a bit from there. Uh, so, a lot depends on how RBI positions a rate hike if it does a rate hike next week. Uh, Pranjul, hi, uh, morning. You know, uh, the title of your report for the GDP numbers was the handle that government lifts GDP growth and you've detailed uh, your reasons why you think that. And I think it's, <coughs> I mean, uh, most, most agree with that point of view. Just a quick point uh, on what this means for growth uh, for the for full F519, because there are various pulls and uh, pressures, right? I mean, is it clear that growth is going to uh, get a lot better uh, as compared to the exit growth rate of F518? Well, look, it's a, it's a very tricky year. There are lots and lots of moving parts. Uh, you know, there are many things which call for a growth to actually rise higher. Uh, you know, uh, last year, because of some of the teething issues with GST, a lot of our exports, uh, exporters felt uh, working capital problems. Some of that is getting addressed this year, so hopefully exports will do better uh, this year. Uh, also, we have a low base in the first half of FY19. That should support higher, higher growth. Uh, uh, finally, also, you know, the government uh, is likely to do, do a lot of spending. You know, in pre-election years, there's a lot of boost to cons construction because the government's tried to finish off a lot of projects. That could also give a cyclical, you know, increase to growth. So there are a couple of reasons why growth should be higher uh, uh, this year. But at the same time, there are many reasons why growth should be lower. Uh, you know, oil is rising. That takes away from growth momentum. Uh, financial conditions have tightened uh, quite considerably. Uh, and, 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 you know, and our banks are still deleveraging. So all of these take away from growth. I think just putting both of them together, uh, growth will be high in the first half of FY19, largely because of a low base effect. It could be closer to 8%. But towards the second half of FY19, I think, the, I think growth is going to uh, moderate and go to was a 6.5 percent range so it's going to be a very interesting years with a lot with lots of ups and downs okay what about the rupee we've already seen a significant depreciation of around four and a half four percent this year uh, how much more do you think is left in store when it comes to the rupee Well, uh, you know, our own call is, uh, you know, towards the end of the year, uh, about 66, 67. Uh, so not too much more depreciation uh, at this point. You know, this is our this is our house call. Uh, but you know, the current account deficit is something we need to be watchful on. Uh, of course, it's a function of oil prices. We know that every time oil prices rise rise, rise by ten dollar a barrel, the current account deficit widens by 0.4 percent of GDP. So that's going to be a big big factor. The other is a lot of our non-core imports. You know, India's preference for SaaS smartphones, for electronics and so on, which seems to have increased quite rapidly, especially after demonetization, is something that is weighing in on our current account deficit. Uh, so, you know, I, I'll sort of be nervous on that front. Uh, but having said that, I think we should also keep a watchful eye, eye on exports. It's quite possible that when all of the GST-related, you know, mess is sort of cleaned up, 
then our exporters will see better days and with, with now the rupee depreciating a little bit, our exports could rise. So that could take away some of the pain from the current account deficit. Overall, we think you know, the current account deficit will widen 1.9% last year uh, to 2.3% this year. Uh, you know, FDI inflows don't increase very rapidly in a given year. So our reliance on portfolio inflows uh, will be high. We've already seen $7 billion of outflows since the last policy meeting. So it is going to keep us in a vulnerable position, and we'll be waiting and watching. All right, uh, Pranjul, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate you joining in, and uh, good speaking with you, as always. Uh, uh, thanks very much for joining us again. Okay, we take a, another very quick break here uh, with news that the market is still down about eight or nine points. Uh, take that quick break. See you on the other side. Okay, uh, welcome back. I mean, so it's absolutely flat. We're off the lows uh, for sure. I mean, so let me see what the low today was. It was 10,648 and we're at 10,693. So it's 35 points off the low. Uh, as we speak, the high was 10,770. I mean, so again, we're about, what, 80 points off the highs as well, right in uh, the middle of where... Uh, I mean, both the high and the low. Well, uh, let's get you some opinion now. We spoke with Pramod Gubi of Ambit uh, Equities, Ambit Capital, uh, and uh, these are his thoughts on where we stand as far as markets go and where we are headed. Listen it. Been a bit uh, dichotomous in the sense that uh, while the index um, has broadly remained uh, stable, uh, we've seen significantly deeper corrections uh, uh, outside the index in the broader market, uh, particularly in mid and small caps. Um, you know, uh, we, we would rather hope that uh, even some of the large cap names uh, correct a bit before it starts getting attractive from a valuation perspective, particularly given the sort of uh, headwinds that we're facing from a macro perspective. We would like uh, um, some of these names to be uh, a little more cheaper than, uh, than what they are.